Elizabeth Short was born on July the 29th, 1924 in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. Shortly after she was born, her parents moved the family to Medford, Massachusetts. Cleo Short, Elizabeth's father, was making a living designing and building miniature golf courses. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, playing miniature golf was the last thing on people's minds. Business dried up and he abandoned his wife Phoebe and his five daughters. Cleo proceeded to fake his suicide by leaving his empty car near a bridge, leading authorities to believe he had jumped into the river below. After her husband abandoned the family, Phoebe was left to deal with the hard times of the Depression and had to raise the five girls on her own. She moved to a small apartment in Medford and to support her family, started working as a bookkeeper and a clerk in a bakery shop. But most of the Short family's money came from public assistance. One day in 1942, Phoebe received a letter from Cleo, who, in the afterlife, had moved to sunny California. He apologized and told Phoebe that he wanted to come home to her. No deal, she said without emotion and refused to take him back. Elizabeth grew up to be a very pretty girl, always looking older and acting more sophisticated than she really was. She was known as Betty to her family and friends, but as she got older she preferred to be called Beth. Everyone who knew her liked her and although she had serious problems with asthma, she was considered very bright and lively. She was also fascinated by the movies, which was her family's main source of affordable entertainment. She found an escape at the theatre that she couldn't find in the day-to-day -day drudgery of ordinary life. One of her childhood friends reminisced. Beth was a porcelain china doll with beautiful eyes. Think of them as blue, but sometimes would change depending on the colour she wore and became greenish. When Elizabeth was older, Cleo offered that she could come and live with him in California until she was able to find a job. Elizabeth had worked in restaurants and theatres in the past, but her real hope was to be spotted by talent scouts and become a movie star, and thought California perfect to realise her dream. Driven by her enthusiasm for the movies, Elizabeth packed her things and headed to live with Cleo in Vallejo, California in early 1943. It did not take much time before their relationship became strained. Her father would scold her for her laziness, poor housekeeping and dating too many men. He eventually kicked Elizabeth out in mid-1943 and she was forced to fend for herself.
Elizabeth applied for a job as a cashier at the post exchange at Camp Cook. The serviceman quickly noticed her and she won the title of Camp Cutie of Camp Cook in a beauty contest. However, Elizabeth was emotionally vulnerable and desperate for a permanent relationship which would lead to marriage. Word spread that Elizabeth was not an easy girl, which kept her at home instead of on dates most nights. She became uncomfortable at Camp Cook and left to stay with a girlfriend who lived near Santa Barbara. Elizabeth had her only run-in with the law during this time. On the night of September the 23rd, 1943, she had been out with a group of friends in a restaurant until they became a bit too boisterous and the owners decided to call the police. Elizabeth was under age at the time and so she was booked and fingerprinted but never charged. The police officer felt sorry for her and arranged for Elizabeth to be sent back to Massachusetts. It was not long before Elizabeth returned to California this time to Hollywood. In Los Angeles, Elizabeth met a pilot named Lieutenant Gordon Fickling and fell immediately in love with him. He was the type of man she had been searching for all this time and quickly made plans to marry him. However, her plans were abruptly halted when Fickling was shipped out to Europe on maneuvers. Elizabeth took a few modeling jobs but felt her career path was moving way too slow. She went back east to spend the holidays in Medford before moving in with relatives in Miami. She began dating servicemen again, with marriage still on her mind. This time, she fell in love with a pilot called Major Matt Gordon. He promised to marry her after he returned from his post in India. However, this was never to be. She received a telegram stating that Major Gordon had been killed in action. This news left Elizabeth totally heartbroken. She went through a period of mourning where she told her friends that Matt had actually been her husband and that their baby had died in childbirth. Once she began to recover, she attempted to return to her old life by contacting her Hollywood friends. One of those friends was Gordon Fickling, her former errant boyfriend. Seeing him as a possible replacement for Matt Gordon, she began to write to him and met with him in Chicago when he was in town for a few days. She was soon hearing wedding bells again and agreed to join him in Long Beach before she moved back to California to continue pursuing her dream of being in the movies. However, the relationship soon soured and he called it off when men would flirt with her and she would flirt back. She later wrote a letter to Fickling. I do hope you find a nice girl to kiss at midnight on New Year's Eve. It would have been wonderful if we belonged to each other now. I'll never regret coming west to see you. You didn't take me in your arms and keep me there. However, it was nice as long as it lasted.
On the 9th of January 1947, she returned to Los Angeles to meet her family after a trip to San Diego with a married salesman named Robert Manley. He had arranged with a friend of his to get her a job interview, but she didn't follow up. When Manley heard that Beth hadn't made it to the job interview, he became worried and wrote to her to find out if she was okay. She said she was fine but didn't like San Diego. She wanted a ride back to Los Angeles. She asked him if he'd help her out and he agreed. Beth and Manley drove until nightfall and then they stopped at a roadside motel for the night. They went out for dinner and drinks before returning to their room to go to bed. Manley claims his night with Beth was strictly platonic. He took the bed and she slept in a chair. Manley dropped her at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, where she was to meet her sister. The hotel staff recollect having seen her using the telephone. The last time she was seen was at the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge on South Olive Street, about a half a mile from the hotel. Robert M. Red Manley was the last person seen with Elizabeth Short before she disappeared. On January the 15th, 1947, a housewife named Betty Bersinger left her home on Norton Avenue in the Limit Park section of Los Angeles, bound for a shoe repair shop. She took her three-year-old daughter with her and as they walked along the street, coming up on the corner of Norton and 39th, they passed by several vacant lots that were overgrown with weeds. She couldn't help but feel a little depressed as she looked out over the deserted area. Development had been halted here because of the war and the abandoned lots had always given her a sense of unease when she passed them. She tried to shrug this feeling off on this morning, blaming her emotional state on the grey skies and the creeping cold of a bleak winter day. As she walked a little further along, she caught a glimpse of something white lying in the weeds. She was not surprised. It wasn't uncommon for people to dispose of rubbish on the empty lots, but this particular object caught her attention. It looked as though someone had left a broken department store mannequin there. The dummy appeared to have been damaged and the two halves lay separated from one another, with the bottom half lying twisted into what was admittedly a macabre pose. Who would throw such a thing into an empty lot? Betty shook her head and walked on, but then found her gaze drawn back to the ghostly white mannequin. She looked again and then realized that this was no department store dummy at all. It was the severed body of a woman. With a sharp intake of breath and a stifled scream, she took her daughter away immediately from the gruesome sight and ran to a nearby house. From here, she telephoned the police. The Los Angeles Police Department noted that the woman's body seemed to have been posed. The woman was lying on her back with her arms raised over her shoulders and her legs were spread in a twisted display of seductiveness. There were cuts and abrasions all across her body and her mouth had been sliced from ear to ear to imitate a ghastly smile. Investigators believe she had been tied down and tortured for several days 
Due to the rope marks on her wrists, ankles and neck, her naked body had been cleanly sliced in half just above her waist. Detective Lieutenant Jesse Haskins described the condition of the body when he first arrived at the crime scene. The body was lying with the head towards the north, the feet towards the south. The left leg was five inches west of the sidewalk. The body was lying face up and the severed part was jogged over about ten inches, the upper half of the body from the lower half. There was a tire track right up against the curbing and there was what appeared to be a possible bloody heel mark in this tire mark and on the curbing which is very low there was one spot of blood and there was an empty paper cement sack lying in the driveway and it also had a spot of blood on it. It had been brought there from some other location. The body was clean and appeared to have been washed. While the detectives investigated the crime scene, the woman's body was transported to the Los Angeles County Morgue. The LAPD wanted to identify her as quickly as possible. They lifted her fingerprints and needed to safely and swiftly send them to the FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. However, severe winter storms at the time had the potential to delay the identification request for up to a week. But a new machine called a sound photo machine and owned by the Herald Express helped in transmitting the images to the FBI. With these readable prints, the FBI identified the victim as 22-year-old Elizabeth Short. The autopsy report put down the cause of death to be severe concussion and hemorrhaging stemming from lacerations on the head and face. The time of death was estimated to be during the late evening of the 14th of January or early morning of the 15th. The body was severely mutilated with cuts all over and superficial tissue loss from her right breast. There were ligature marks on her neck, wrists and ankles and her anus was dilated which indicated that she may have been tied up and raped. It was apparent that the lower half was separated after her death and deliberately laid out in the manner it was found. No one knows where she went, who she met, how or why she was taken. For six whole days, Elizabeth Short dropped off the map. No one knows exactly what happened during this time, but for poor Beth, the end was horrible. Whoever killed her tortured her too, tied her up, beat her, force-fed her feces, smashed the butt of a gun into her forehead, throttled her, and slashed her cheeks open with a knife. The official cause of death was hemorrhage and shock due to concussion of the brain and lacerations of the face. She may have still been breathing, albeit slowly choking on her own blood as he began to slice her in half. After the sensational splash of the body dump, there was no new evidence, no leads, no viable suspect. The newspapers reworked their original vision of the Dahlia to keep the public's interest piqued. 
the fairy tale innocent naive dreamer became a good time girl, a habitual liar and a slut. Nonetheless, as the weeks went by, the case looked as though it would go cold and disappear from view. But the killer had a coda. On January the 24th, the editor of The Examiner, James Richardson, received a mysterious phone call. The voice congratulated him on The Examiner coverage of the Black Dahlia case, then said, You seem to have run out of material. Maybe I can be of some assistance. The call was followed by a special delivery to the examiner officers, an envelope containing the contents of Elizabeth Short's purse, her ID, birth certificate, business cards, and pitifully, the obituary of Matt Gordon, the war hero she never actually wed. Her address book kicked the case into media overdrive once more. Here, in Elizabeth's handwriting, were the names and numbers of a long list of potential suspects with many prominent Los Angeles residents and movie personalities among them. To add to the intrigue, certain pages had been torn out. The entire package had been soaked in gasoline to remove any fingerprints prior to sending. It was certainly an incendiary device, fueling years of speculation, conspiracy theories and controversy about who could commit such an awful act, and the reasons for wanting her dead, if there could be any viable reasons for such insanity. To date, the Black Dahlia murder has never been solved. Over the years though, many suspects have emerged, along with a number of false confessions and ridiculous stories and theories. Because of the lurid and mysterious nature of the crime, it seems to be one of those cases that everyone has an opinion about. In addition, the initial investigation of the case revealed a number of suspects that all eventually played out over time. There have been some interesting theories within the police department to the possibility that the killer was the same culprit in the Cleveland Torso murders several years prior to Elizabeth's murder. During the original investigation, investigators ran across a number of leads and questioned many suspects, including nightclub owner Mark Hansen, who owned a nightclub and was known to have made sexual advances to Elizabeth that were rejected. However, they couldn't discover any concrete evidence against him. Red Manley appears simply to have had the bad luck to get involved with a woman who turned out to be as complex as Beth, and who ended up dead. Manley was given the third degree at police headquarters and only released after a polygraph test. He was exonerated but the case never really ended for him. Suspicion and mental problems plagued him for the rest of his life. And in 1954 his wife had him committed to the Patton State Hospital in San Bernardino where he spent the rest of his life, dying there on January the 16th, 1986. One more promising lead involved an army corporal and combat veteran named Joseph Dumas. He was reported to the military police by another soldier who had argued with Dumas over money. After a 42-day furlough, the corporal was found with blood all over his clothing and a stack of newspaper clippings about the murder. 
He had little memory of what he may have done during his furlough. He told investigators, It is possible that I could have committed the murder. When I get drunk, I get rough with women. Dumas was sent to a psychiatrist but was cleared of killing Beth. So, who killed Beth? Author and former head of the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit, John Douglas, had his own theories based on his own past experiences profiling serial and dangerous killers. Douglas described the killer as a white man, certainly no younger than his late twenties, with a high school education, he lived alone, worked with his hands and was comfortable with a knife and blood, possibly a butcher or slaughterhouse worker. He was also familiar with prostitutes and, although compulsive, was also patient and deliberate. He was also a heavy drinker and under financial stress. He spent several days with the victim and, when drunk, let his personal stress and the alcohol combine into a murderous rage. He cut Beth's body in half to make transportation easier, but also chose mutilation to make a personal statement about the rage he felt towards her. Severing the body both dehumanized and defeminized her. Douglas also believed that the killer chose the dump site for a reason, perhaps a personal connection to the neighborhood, perhaps because of some financial setback caused by the fact that the construction in the area was halted because of the war. Here is a shortened list of over 200 suspects in the case. 1. Robert Manley Manley was the last known person to see Elizabeth alive. He was initially booked as a suspect but was released after he passed a polygraph test. Beset by a long history of mental health problems, in 1954 his wife committed him to a psychiatric hospital after he told her he was hearing voices. That same year, doctors gave him a shot of sodium pentothal, Acha, the truth serum, in another attempt to glean information about the Black Dahlia murder from him. He was absolved a second time. Two, Mark Hansen. Hansen's name was embossed on the address book that was mailed to the examiner. It's unclear how the item fell into Beth's hands. The 55-year-old Denmark native was the manager of the Florentine Gardens, a sleazy Hollywood nightclub featuring burlesque shows. Many of the young women working for Hansen lived at his home, which was located behind the club. Elizabeth was his guest for several months in 1946, and the aging Lothario is rumored to have tried to bed her, unsuccessfully. Three, George Hodel. In 2003, a retired LAPD detective named Steve Hodel published another Daddy Did It tract, but this one became a national bestseller. According to the Black Dahlia Avenger, a genius for murder, Hodel Jr. depicts his dad as a tyrant and misogynistic pervert who held orgies at the family home, 
and was put on trial for raping his own 14-year-old daughter, he was acquitted. After his father died in 1999, Steve Hodel acquired his father's private photo album which contained two snapshots of a dark-haired woman. Hodel claims the woman was Elizabeth, but Elizabeth's family has refuted his claims. Walter Alonzo Bailey. In 1997, a Los Angeles Times writer named Larry Harnish suggested yet another suspect. Dr. Walter Alonzo Bailey, a surgeon whose house was located one block south of the lot where Elizabeth's body was found. Bailey's daughter was a friend of Beth's sister, Virginia. Harnish theorizes that Bailey suffered from a degenerative brain disease that made him kill Elizabeth. While the police believe Elizabeth's killer was affiliated with a cutting profession, perhaps a surgeon or butcher, Bailey was 67 at the time of the murder and had no known record of violence or crime. Neither is it known whether he had actually met Elizabeth. But no matter the number of theories, books and documentaries on the case, to this date it remains unsolved. No matter who considers themselves an expert on the case, the truth is that no one was ever charged for the murder of Elizabeth Short. She remains an elusive mystery from the dark side of Hollywood. Close to 200 suspects were interviewed, sometimes polygraphed, but all eventually released. Exhaustive efforts were made to chase down any leads from the several false confessions to the killing of Elizabeth by both men and women. Despite efforts made by investigators, the case has remained one of the most famous unsolved cases in California's history. Well, my dear friends, uh, I hope you're not too traumatized after that journey into Elizabeth's life and her final days. Um, yeah, I, I, I try to turn off. Uh, I become professional when dealing with crime cases. Um, yeah, but there are some which affect me deeply and, and leave me to ponder for many days. And, and this is one of them. Yeah, just horrific. What a horrific end. Um, the images, uh, I used censored images and I stylized another image uh, and censored it. Um, I thought the, the description was enough. You know, that's enough. If, if you really wish, there is lots of graphic and gory images of her body to be found on the internet. You know, out of respect for her and out of consideration for you, my viewers, I decided not to include them. Um, yes, this was um, obviously a very evil person who committed this atrocity. Uh, it wasn't just something done in a drug-induced or drunken rage. Uh, the person taunted the police and the press afterwards and um, had her belongings. This shows someone with a devious and uh, horrific mind. I, just, I can't even imagine that person being able to sleep at night, but I think he could. There are some things that you and I just don't understand. There are monsters roaming this earth. That, that's for sure. Anyway, on a lighter note, a bit of tautology there where I said, was it Hanson was a nightclub owner who owned a nightclub? Sorry about that. Yeah, some, some, sometimes things like that slip by and it gets a bit too uh, difficult to 
remove it uh, afterwards. I hope you don't mind that. <laughs> yes, um, I would love to know your theories, if you have any. You know, there's a, obviously a lot of suspects uh, in this case. Um, I did read some article, you know, after I had done the narration for this video. Uh, it was about a psychic who had apparently been in touch with uh, Beth's spirit. Um, and I was, you know, I'm not saying I believe this. Uh, I have an open mind to such things. I'm not saying it's untrue. Uh, but she, she wrote it quite, um, she wrote it quite plausibly. Yeah. If, if, you know, some people might think that psychics are not plausible. As I say, I have an open mind. And it was quite interesting that she had uh, made contact with Beth's spirit, as I said. And that uh, Beth had, was too, too traumatized to relive the actual murder of herself. But she did name the person. Um, and it turned out that this guy had been known as a violent sex pervert and um, he had sort of confessed to the crime in real life this is um, under an alias he was saying that it was a friend of his that had committed the crime um, and, and this person this offender died very shortly afterwards uh, in a burning hotel fire he he dropped a cigarette while he was asleep and he burnt to death um, Anyway, these are just all these interesting uh, theories you can read up uh, when you start searching the internet. Um, you know, I find that was, you know, was not one of the run-of-the-mill theories, so I, I thought it was quite interesting. And, uh, yeah, I would love to know your theories. I don't really have one. I have no idea who committed it, but I do hope they are dead and uh, getting their just desserts somewhere. Anyway, my friends, I uh, hope you enjoyed this month with the question and answer video, which I'm doing after this video, so I won't be able to comment on it because uh, I'm a bit back to front here. I'll be doing this immediately afterwards. I hope it was a good month for you on Patreon, and I look forward to more next month. Uh, take care, my friends, and until next time, stay safe. All the best. Bye-bye.